In this series of videos, we have been building up an XML file that looks like so. And in this video, we are going to describe what XPath is and why we will use it. In the next video, we'll look at some specific examples. But in this video, we're just going to say what XPath is. First of all, a few credits. Uh, a lot of the presentation that you're seeing came from uh, some research I did on several websites that are listed inside of this presentation. In addition, I did pull uh, a bit of information from W3C schools and also from Professor Robert Rokey at the University of Cincinnati. So, why XPath? Uh, XPath is nice because, as we see, we start to build an XML file and it can get rather long. This one is relatively short by XML standards, only about 34 lines or so. But if you get to a typical XML file, it can be a little bit difficult to find what you want to find. So XPath allows us to find what we want inside of an XML file using some fairly simple terms. XPath is somewhat universal as well. It is implemented by many different programming languages, including Java, JavaScript, and many of the C flavor languages. One thing that I really like about XPath is that it is easy to test, uh, even on the web, using something like this XPath Evaluator at freeformatter.com. So that's one of the websites that I'm using in this presentation. And in our next presentation, we'll do a few validations, uh, a few XPaths within this website. So uh, that makes it very nice. Uh, another big principle that we are going to use is that XPath is used significantly in XSLT, or in other words, XML transformation, which is when we are going from uh, one XML, we're taking an XML file, we're translating it to look like another XML file. Uh, it could very well be that we're making an XML file look like HTML, which we'll look at that in a later presentation as well. So that's why we like XPath. So first of all, when we're thinking about XPath, a lot of times it's a good idea to visualize our XML by looking at it in a tree format. Uh, a website that I like for doing this is called CodeBeautify. So I'm going to run to CodeBeautify and load up our file. Uh, this does a lot of handy things. So you see that we can load XML from a URL, we can browse from our disk, uh, or we can simply paste it and I'm going to do a bit of copy and paste. So I run over to the XML document that we've been building up in this video series. I have changed the specimens to be some more realistic data. I have a plant that's roughly in Cincinnati, a plant that's roughly in London, and a plant that is somewhere in South America. I wasn't too picky on the latitude and longitude, but I got a diversity of hemispheres that we can take a look at. So in any case, I control A, control C, and then I tab over to my XML viewer and paste it in like so. We see that one thing it can do is beautify and format. Mine happens to already be formatted, but if I maybe copy and pasted this and, and my tabs were not correct, uh, so I'll intentionally mess them. Whoops, can't do that. We do need some valid XML. But if my if you know if I have some run-on lines here and tabs don't look good and a few things that are flush left that shouldn't be like so. I can go in and beautify format and you see it's going to take what I have on the left and it's going to make it look like we have on the right, uh, which is a better looking document. It's easier to visualize. It's easier to see uh, where we have tags that are children of other tags. So in other words, you see specimen here as a parent. It has a child called specimen singular. Specimen singular has a series of children. And so these children, latitude, longitude, planted by in comments, are effectively grandchildren of specimens, plural. It's easy to visualize this when we see it tabbed out like so. But nonetheless, there's an even easier way to visualize this. And actually, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm going to take this back to how it used to look. Control V, there we go. If I click on tree view, it allows us to see this ancestor relationship across elements. So you see, I can collapse it all the way up to the very high level root element called plant. But then I can expand plant. I can see all of plants direct children and their values. Then I can go down and I can see the child called specimens, again, plural specimens. And this allows me to click through and see the children of specimens, which are each individual specimen elements. And then I can see the children of those specimen elements, just like so. 
So you see, this helps me to visualize the hierarchical structure of my XML file. And being able to visualize it like this is going to make it a lot easier to use an XPath to query it. Actually, I should say, make it easier to write an XPath that will query this structure. Okay, so we want to visualize our XML. And uh, a few definitions before we jump in and take a look at what an XPath is. First of all, a node is something that you can select with an XPath. It can be an element, can be an attribute, text, comment, namespace. What do we mean by that? Well, in this file, uh, I don't have many attributes, but an attribute we've seen before in, in HTML, that's where we have a name equals a value, and that is within a tag, so that would be an attribute. Okay, genus, as we see here, genus would be an element, and the element genus contains the text called Circus. So the three things I've shown you so far, an attribute, an element, and the text within an element, each of these are given a very general term called node. The comment that we see up here, that's also considered a node. And then this is a, um, well, actually, we don't have a namespace in this one, but um, namespace is something that we use to identify what tags belong to. That's also considered a node. So nonetheless, we have several things that are, that are kind of several different things that are given a general term called node. And that general term node is something that is selectable with with uh, XPath. Okay, we talked about the relationships between nodes just a moment ago. We talked about parent, children, grandchildren, sibling. Those are fairly self-explanatory. So the specimen has children. Okay, latitude, the sibling of latitude is longitude planted by uncommons. These are three, these are four things we would consider siblings. So um, no big surprise there. Okay, so some XPath terms. First of all, let's say that we want to reach down and we want to get information about this first specimen that we have here, the one called Beautiful Tree. To do that, we have to understand how to navigate from the root called plant to the child called specimens to the child called specimen. So you see we're jumping from an ancestor to a child to a child of that child and then potentially even deeper into the children of the child called specimen. So we need to navigate a path from root all the way down. To do that, we are going to use a slash. A slash indicates a separation between parent and child. We'll typically start at the root, so slash plants slash specimens. That's a good example. That is the, that is a, a kind of an uh, an easy way if we happen to know the entire path down to a node and, uh, and or if we want to select all nodes. But sometimes we only want to select uh, certain nodes, okay? And by that I mean if we look at our XML, we'll look at it in tree view, we know we have three different specimens here. Maybe we want to see all specimens, but maybe we only want to see certain specimens. So I can specifically pick the first specimen. I can specifically pick the last specimen. I can pick any specimen in between. And I can also pick specimens that meet certain criteria. So let's take a look at that. To pick a specific specimen, we're going to use the square bracket construction that you see here. If I, if I say square bracket in one, that is going to return to me the very first specimen. If I say square bracket and I say latitude is greater than zero, that is only going to return specimens with a latitude greater than zero, which essentially means the Northern Hemisphere. So it would pick up this specimen in Cincinnati, this specimen in London, but it would miss this specimen in South America because that has a latitude that is less than zero. Uh, so, okay, if we want to pick the very last one, we simply say last, open and close paren, like so, and that gives us the last specimen. A few more XPath terms. Let's say we don't know the entire path down to a node. If that's the case, then instead of starting at root, we simply use the double slash, as you see here, and it will look throughout the entire tree, and it will find an element with a given name. In this case, we're using slash slash genus. Okay, now the at symbol, 
The add symbol allows us to look at attributes. And I mentioned I don't have a whole lot of attributes in this uh, particular XML, but a lot of XML files will have attributes. So we'll have at symbol, then the attribute name, and then if we wish, we can put an equality operator in, and we can say only attributes that have a certain value, like in this case, I've said top. A few others, a single dot means the current node, and a double dot means the parent of the current node. So these are a few more XPath terms. I personally use the ones on the previous slide the most. These ones I'll use occasionally if I have a specific need, but the XPath terms we see here, the slash and the square brackets, those are the ones that I personally like to use the most. Okay, within the square brackets, we can do several things. We can do some math, add some things together. Uh, we can do some comparison operations, and we can do some combinations, so add, or, and modulo. So math is self-explanatory, plus to add things together, minus to subtract. The, oops, sorry, uh, the asterisk is to multiply, and the letters div to divide. Now careful if you're a programmer by trade, it's not the slash, that's kind of a special character. We actually use the term div to divide. Comparison operators, uh, the, uh, some of these are useful for Boolean. A lot of them are useful for numerical comparisons, which we'll see when we do an example. So single equal means equality. Exclamation equal means not equal. So again, think of those with a Boolean, true or false. A lot of ways you can do that. Uh, also, you, you can use those for other types as well, but I tend to think Booleans for those too. So less than, less than equal, greater than, greater than equal, obviously, to uh, do those comparisons respectively. This is really nice if you want to only select certain parts of an XML document that are less than a certain amount or greater than a certain amount. And then and or modulo. So and means put these two things, uh, put these two together, or means one or the other. Modulo is remainder of division, which is oftentimes used if you need to alternate how you color uh, odd and even rows in a table, something like that. So several operators will get some experience with uh, a few of these when we do our examples. Okay, uh, some examples, I'll tell you what, we'll go ahead and freeze right here because this is a good point to jump into our next video where we're going to take a look at some XML and we're going to try a few things out. So I'll freeze this, we'll take a look at that, and we will use the free formatter website to test out our XPath. Uh, a lot of times, I will, I will if, if I'm programming, I will put an XPath inside of a program, something that compiles but I will test it out by going to this free formatter tool first to make sure that the XPath does deliver what I want it to do before I actually put it in code and compile that code. So anyway, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. In our next video, we'll take a look at these examples and possibly some others. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.